today on PowerPoint with Jack Graham. Here is the truth. Jesus Christ is Lord of life and Lord of all. He is the Savior and the only Savior of the world. The Bible is God's infallible, inerrant word breathed out by Him. God created the heavens and the earth with His word when He spoke it into being. God created them male and female. Marriage, God's way, is between a man and a woman. Life is sacred. And Jesus is Lord of life. He's coming again, and He will bring justice to the world and to the future. This is our series, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. We're in a portion now, a chapter, if you will, uh, dealing with Jesus and his confrontations. Jesus and his confrontations. So begin finding John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Uh, Jesus is the Lord of life. And that's the topic, that's the theme of the Gospel of John. And certainly John chapter 10, which is one of the well-known passages in all of the Bible. We'll get to it in just a moment. Jesus had enemies. You know that, right? While he was loved and beloved by multitudes, many rejected him. He came into his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him to them gave you the right to be called the children of God, even to them who believe on his name. But uh, many rejected Jesus and many resisted him violently at some times. And there was a public plan in the air to ruin him. They described him, they meaning the culture, and it was a religious culture that said he was a drunk, a glutton, a demon-possessed maniac who broke the commandments of God, that he was a madman. These uh, descriptions of Jesus were offered by religious right-wing wingnuts who were more holy than God. And they attacked Jesus relentlessly and rigorously. So what did Jesus do? Jesus fought back. Yes, he did. In fact, he called these religious, the Pharisees and others, someone described them, Pharisees in whom the milk of human kindness had curdled call them whitewashed tombs, snakes, masked hypocrites, blind guys of the blind. And he even said, your daddy is the devil. Your father is the devil. He called them also thieves and robbers. It was a confrontation between Jesus and and religion. And this was not a way to win friends and influence people. He was, it all culminated, of course, in a crucifixion. After Jesus was illegally arrested and tried and sentenced to the death penalty, he went to a cross voluntarily, laying down his life, but his life taken. So Jesus met confrontation in his life and ministry. And so this is why we're taking some time in this series to talk about some of these confrontations. Last week's message was on temptation and how to overcome it. How Jesus took on the devil and confronted the devil in the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit. If you heard that message, I would encourage you to go back and get it and listen to it if you haven't. But we talked about ways that we could expect temptation and detect temptation of its various kinds and then reject temptation in the power of Christ. There is a devil. There are demonic forces, including religious forces, that are anti-God and anti-Christ. 
And there are, as Jesus called them, thieves that come to kill, steal, and to destroy. And so we're going to read the scripture beginning at verse 7 of John chapter 10. So Jesus again said to them, and he's talking confrontationally with a religious crowd. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Just circle those words, I am the door. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. And he's talking about false prophets here. He's confronting error and false prophet and religious phonyism and all the rest. And he said again in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And here's why Jesus came. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Circle those words, lays down his life. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The wolf speaks of Satan himself. He flees, that is, the hireling flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down, circle that again, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold and I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me. And here it is again. I lay down my life that I might take it again. Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. I am the living door. He also went on to say, I am the shepherd, the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. So just a bit of background here. The shepherds in the ancient world would gather the flock together at night or even at noonday and build a fence, typically with rocks. And they would build a fence around the sheep, around the flock, no matter how large or small the flock may be, and building this fence, they would leave a gap or an opening where the sheep could go in and out, of course, like a rancher might build a sheep fold today or a cattle stall. But there was this fence and then this gap at the opening. And at night, when the sheep were counting sheep and safely tucked in, sometimes I just laugh at the stuff I say. Nobody else does, but I thought that was funny. <laughs> The sheep are laying down to sleep, and what does the good shepherd do? He doesn't run away because there are wolves howling and, and there are people, are people, thieves and robbers who could come and steal the sheep. What does he do? He lays down, and he lays down at the door of the sheepfold. At this gap, at this opening, the shepherd, the good shepherd, would literally lay down to protect the sheep. This is... The beautiful illustration that Jesus is giving concerning himself, that he is the door of the sheepfold, the good shepherd. I want to talk about Jesus, the Lord of life, who is the door, the door of division, the door of decision, and the door of destiny. Those three points, if you're taking notes. First, the door of division. Of course, a door not only invites people in, but it also keeps others out. A door hinges and swings both ways, typically. And the, the purpose of a door is to welcome people in and then close the door behind them to keep them in, or to keep the sheep in this case, or to provide an exit. And so... A door, in this sense, divides. 
A door divides and separates between those who are in the fold, the flock, the church, and those who are out. Now, Jesus said, I am the one door of the sheepfold. I am the one who lays down my life as the good shepherd for the sheep. Now, our culture, even some in religious culture, says that there are many doors into the sheepfold, into God's family, God's flock. And people today want options. <clears throat> people want options. If they don't like plan A, they'll take plan B or plan D or C or, and so on. And what we hear today in the culture are words like, what is true for you may be your truth, but that's not my truth. So to say your truth is my truth and my truth may not be your truth, all that nonsense, just as there are absolutes in money and in medicine and in measurements and in math, there are is absolute truth in morality according to the Word of God. But the big problem we have in the church today is that we would rather live with compromise rather than conviction and preach a gospel of tolerance rather than the gospel of truth, which is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you follow me, you will have enemies. When you think about it, this is the keeping of the second commandment, to be willing to tell people the truth in love. What is the first commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And then he said, the second is like it, your neighbor as yourself. So people today, many people want to say, well, to love means I won't offend anyone. No, that's not true. If you love someone and you care about someone, you will love them enough to tell them the truth and to speak that truth with love and compassion. You would do that with your children if you love your children. I can tell you, I love you church. I love this congregation, this church family, and I love you enough to tell you the truth and from God's word. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hold back on that. But there's truth regarding morality. There is one option, and that is to be all in. All in. Jesus said, if you follow me, you must go through one door and be all in. So you're either out or you're in. And the way you are in is via the Lord Jesus Christ. I was reading recently a quote from the wonderful Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny is a powerful testimony for Christ. She, was, uh, she became a uh, quadriplegic in a diving accident when she was a teenager. She's been in a chair ever since, but her powerful witness has been so strong, and she's written regarding suffering and pain and hope and heaven. And, but she's also written concerning culture and morality, and uh, this, this quote from Johnny stunned me. Uh, it, it, was, it stuck out. So what she said... Gradually, talking about the culture, the issues that make us shake our heads, gradually, though no one remembers exactly how it happened, the unthinkable becomes tolerable and then acceptable and then legal and then applaudable. That's what's happened in the world today. What we used to believe would be unthinkable has now become tolerable and then acceptable and then legal and ultimately applaudable. This is how abortion on demand took root in this country and in the world. It became legal and then applaudable. And while we're making legal process and progress, on this issue, the battle is far from over. And we must continue to stand for the sanctity of life. 
and we must not forfeit the gospel of truth for the gospel of tolerance. There was an old movie back in the day. They said, love means never having to say you're sorry. Well, that's a terrible quote. <laughs> love means you will say you're sorry, of course. And Jesus said that these thieves, and a word that he uses is the word, we get our word kleptomania from this word. These thieves and, and, and robbers, that is people who ran in gangs. He said they're going to come in with gang-like force and steal and kill and destroy. This is the work of Satan. But he said in contrast to that, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So the contrast, the division is clear. Satan and his crowd, the gangs that destroy and devour and deconstruct faith and lives and families and all the rest. And Jesus pits this against himself who said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. An abundant life is a flourishing life. An abundant life is a life that is uh, full of, 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 of flourishing and flowering and flowing and overflowing. This abundant life is life with a capital L. And unfortunately, many people have existence, but they don't have life because life is in Jesus. And we as the church, we need to remember that we're not a cruise ship. We're not a showboat. We're a battleship. And we will sail, if necessary, bloody seas in order to defend the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that. Dear church, dear people, guest online, from my perspective, I will tolerate people's opinions and even their preferences, but not when it comes to truth. Not when it comes to the word of God. I will never ever compromise the word of God for the tolerance of the culture. And we will affirm what God says is right and what God says is wrong. Here is the truth. Jesus Christ is Lord of life and Lord of all. He is the Savior and the only Savior of the world. The Bible is God's infallible, inerrant word breathed out by him. Amen. God created the heavens and the earth with his word when he spoke it into being. And when he created humanity, he created them male and female. Amen. And when God united the male and female in the in the Garden of Eden, that meant that marriage is between a man and a woman, and then that life is sacred. Life is sacred in the womb and all the way to the tomb. God created them male and female. Marriage, God's way, is between a man and a woman. Life is sacred. And Jesus is Lord of life. He's coming again and he will bring justice to the world and to the future as all will be judged according to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will not compromise on these issues. Secondly, Jesus is the door of decision. The door of decision. Jesus said, look at it in verse 9. He said, I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He says, when you come to me, when you enter by me, you will be given eternal life. You will be saved. Now, life is a gift. Life is the gift of God, of his love and his grace. And Jesus reminds us of this. And when he describes this life, this abundant life, he describes it with sheep going in and out 
of the fold and the flock and into pasture. Jesus describes himself in many ways. The light of the world, the bread of heaven, the resurrection of life, and life, the way, the truth, and the life. But I am captured today by this thought that he is the door and the good shepherd. And he welcomes everyone into the family, into the flock. We have a philosophy here at Prestonwood we believe comes from God's word. And that is, we want to make the door of the church as wide as possible. We want to welcome everyone who wants to come, anyone, the broken, the hurting, the helpless, the sinful, because we're all sinners. But we want to make sure that the door is wide open so that people can enter in. And Jesus was, in effect, opening the door and said, I am the door. And it's a wide open door. If you come to me, you will find and discover this eternal life and this abundant life. And this door, this salvation in Christ means that Jesus becomes the living force of our lives. This is life. And in this life, there is satisfaction. And one more thing, there is security. This is what Jesus talked about. Let me show you one more verse and we'll close. So much more uh, to say. But look on the screen to John chapter 10 and we'll look at verses 22 to 30. Would you join me there? At that time of the feast, the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. That's the outer court. And so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, he'd been telling them plainly. And he said, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you're not among my sheep. And watch this. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus is telling us who he is, that he is God, and that I hear my, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And when they follow me, they're in the Father's hand and they will never perish. Christ is our security. You don't ever have to wonder or worry, will I be unsaved? Can I somehow be snatched away or lose my salvation? Never taught in the Bible. Just start right here if this was the only verse that we are eternally secure that we are forever his. We are kept by the power of God. Peter tells us, uh, look at 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Let's put that on the screen, and then we're going to close it down. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. To an inheritance, watch this, that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept, say kept kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed unto the last time. That means he's going to keep you all the way into eternity. You say, well, couldn't the devil snatch me from the Father's hand? Come on. First of all, don't you know if he could, he would? But no man can pluck them from my Father's hand. No man, no devil of hell, no demon of hell. So we are secure in Christ. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He is our shepherd, and our shepherd will lead us home, even though when through dark valleys, he says, you will not fear, for I am with you. And he said, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's Psalm 23. And that's the abundant life that Jesus promised. So three doors. Do you remember them? A door of division. A door lets people in and shuts others out. 
a door of, of decision, but also a door of destiny. Because your destiny is in God's hand. Amen. Division, decision, and destiny.